Hello friends, this is Jan Curcio back with a Bible study from the Old Testament on the types and shadows of Christ and his plan of redeeming humanity as found in the book of Ruth. And I hope that you've read Ruth at least once before and will read it again after the study. Now, first let me say that, as most of you know, that a type of Christ is a picture drawn of him by the Old Testament writers so that Israel would recognize their Messiah when he would come. For instance, one of the most recognized type of Christ is the ram caught in the thicket provided for Abraham to sacrifice in place of his son Isaac, Genesis 22. And a notable example of a shadow is the temple sacrificial system of ancient Israel that foreshadowed the sacrificial death of Christ. Yet, in spite of the many types and shadows throughout the Old Testament, only a few in Israel recognize Jesus of Nazareth as the promised Messiah. Now, the book of Ruth was aptly placed between the book of Judges and the books of Samuel and the English Bible, since it points to the transition of Israel as a nation led by judges to one led by kings, particularly with the inclusion of King David's genealogy in Ruth, who was the great grandson of Boaz, Ruth's kinsman redeemer. Yet in the Hebrew version of the Old Testament, the Masoretic text, the book of Ruth is placed in the Katavim, the writings, after the book of Proverbs. And as you know, Proverbs ends in chapter 31 with a portrayal of the woman of worth. And so the book of Ruth, which follows Proverbs, is aptly placed as well in the Hebrew version of the Old Testament, given that the character Ruth was a woman of worth. The authorship of Ruth has been ascribed to Samuel the judge and prophet, who might have written it in support of David's ascent to the throne, based on his inclusion of David's genealogy. And for those of you who think that genealogies hold little value, you need to reconsider, for they are the framework on which the scriptures hang. And without that framework, the biblical accounts lack the historicity they merit. And without David's genealogy in the book of Ruth, it reads like a romantic short story. Yet there is much more to this account besides romance, and that not only is it a significant piece of ancient Israel's history, but it is a striking allegory of the redemption of mankind. Now, David's genealogy in Ruth, chapter 4, begins with Judah's son Perez, and I quote, Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Amminadab. Amminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Ovid. Ovid begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. Verses 18 through 22. And 1,200 years, or 14 generations later, Jesus of Nazareth is confirmed in Matthew's Gospel to be the son of David, Israel's designation for their coming Messiah, beginning with Abraham down to David and then on down through his son Solomon's bloodline to Joseph and Mary to Jesus. Uh, Matthew 1, 6 through 17. And for Matthew's Jewish audience, Jesus' genealogy should have been strong evidence of him being the son of David, the huios David in Greek or ben David in the Hebrew. The characters in the book of Ruth are Naomi, whose name means pleasant, who for me is the main character of the book. And then there is Ruth, whose name means friend, the Moabitess widow of Naomi's son Mahlon. And Boaz, whose name means strength, is the wealthy Bethlehemite and master of the harvest. And then there are the minor characters, Orpah, the widow of Chilion, Naomi's other daughter-in-law. And then there is Elimelech's next of kin, who is unnamed. But always bear in mind that Jesus, the redeemer of mankind, is actually the main character of Ruth, always being the centerpiece of all the scriptures. And then there is Elimelech and his sons Chilean and Machlon, who have passed away before the opening of the story. And I must say that Elimelech, whose name means God of the King, has prophetic implication, given that he is the great-great-grandfather of King David, whose God is Jehovah. 
The time frame of Ruth is during the period when judges governed Israel in the absence of a king, perhaps when Ehud was judge in the 13th century before Christ, and when the spiritual climate of Israel was grave, with many having forsaken Jehovah to worship the idols of their Gentile neighbors. The geographical setting of Ruth begins in the Gentile country of Moab, the land located southwest of the Dead Sea, in what is now Jordan, and which is approximately 100 miles from Bethlehem. The final setting of the story outlined in yellow on this map. And at the introduction of the book of Ruth, it is written that Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their sons, Chilean and Mahlon, had relocated to Moab due to the famine in Judah. It was there that Naomi's sons married Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. But while they dwelt in Moab, Elimelech died, and within 10 years, both Naomi's sons died there, leaving her in deep despair and along with her two daughter-in-laws to fend for themselves. And hearing that Bethlehem was reaping a harvest, Naomi decided it was best to return to her homeland. This is a foreshadowing of the return of apostate Jews to Jehovah, which happened to a great extent during the reign of King David. And Moab, an idolatrous nation, could be taken to be a type of the unsaved world of death and destruction as was the case with the fate of Naomi's husband and sons. And this is in sharp contrast to the town of Bethlehem, a place of godly Israelites, a type of the saved world, the place of redemption and restoration. And bear in mind that life and death are a central theme to the book of Ruth, as is redemption, humility, love, and leveret marriage. And note that the town of Bethlehem, which means house of bread, holds more meaning than a place where grain is harvested, but where the bread of life, the Lord of the harvest, would be born. Four centuries after King David, the prophet Micah foretold that, which Matthew later paraphrased, and I quote, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Matthew 2.6, and this can be taken to not only point to King David, the righteous king who shepherded Israel, but the king of all kings who ushered in the kingdom of God, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, as Naomi was preparing to leave Moab for Bethlehem, she said something significant to her daughter-in-laws, and I quote, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight, and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having other husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Ruth 1, 11 through 13. Here Naomi alludes to the custom of leveret marriage, where her childless daughter-in-laws would have been married off to their deceased husband's brothers, kinsmen redeemers, had there been any. And the duty of the kinsman redeemer was to produce a son with his brother's widow in order to carry forth her deceased husband's name. And so Naomi reminds her widow daughter-in-laws that she has no other sons for them and that they should remain in Moab where they would find husbands from among their own people. And Naomi remains deeply grieved, believing that Jehovah had afflicted her through the deaths of her husband and sons, expressed in her response to the people of Bethlehem who welcomed her back, saying, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Now, Mara means bitterness. And I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? 1 verse 20. In that culture, a son was of great asset to his widowed mother, who would have assurance that she would be cared for for the rest of her days. But in the case of a childless widow, not only would there be a great probability of being impoverished, 
even enslaved in order to survive, but her husband's name would not be carried forth, then considered to be a disgrace and a bitter curse. And as Naomi was leaving Moab for Bethlehem, she continued to pressure her daughter-in-laws to return to their families and to their gods, with Arpa doing so, while Ruth adamantly refused to leave her and pled, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Ruth 1, 16 and 17. From this we can say that Ruth had forsaken the gods of Moab to worship the God of Israel, and was re determined not to return to her family and the veneration of their Moabite idols even the national deity Shemesh, in which cult human sacrifice was practiced. In fact, Ruth well demonstrates her loyalty to Jehovah when invoking a curse over herself in the event that she should ever break her commitment to care for Naomi. Opa, on the other hand, showed a lack of commitment to Naomi and Jehovah, seeming all too eager to remain in Moab with her family and their gods. The sharp contrast between the two daughter-in-laws is both striking and disturbing, a picture of those who would commit to Christ and follow after him and those who would not. So Naomi and Ruth arrive in Bethlehem, impoverished and in Naomi's cape, deeply depressed. And while Naomi settles in, Ruth goes right to work in the barley fields, gleaning grain from the corners of a particular field owned by Boaz, who just happens to be a wealthy kinsman of Elimelech. And let me say here that it was the law that grain be intentionally left in the corners, the pe'ah in Hebrew, to be gleaned by the poor, Leviticus 19, 9 through 11. And Boaz took notice of Ruth and was informed by his servant that she was the Moabitess daughter-in-law of Elimelech's widow Naomi, and that she had cared for her mother-in-law after his death, Ruth 2, 5 through 13. So Boaz began to show interest in Ruth, beginning by warning her to stay by his female reefers in order not to be abused by the men, and to help herself to water provided for them, verses 8 and 9. And at the mealtime, he continued to show kindness to her by offering her food and then ordering the reapers to purposely leave grain behind for her to glean, verses 14 through 17. And Ruth asked Boaz, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner, verse 10. And this was a good question, since the Israelites had shunned the Moabites from the time these Gentiles refused to give food and water to the Hebrews during their wilderness period under Moses. And when King Balak of Moab hired Balaam the seer to attempt to cause Jehovah to curse his people. And when Balaam learned that God would not curse those whom he had blessed, he tricked the Hebrew men into fornicating with Moabite women in order to force the hand of God to curse them, Deuteronomy 23.7. And of course, this all backfired. Now, Boaz did not seem concerned about Ruth being a Moabite, perhaps due to his own mother having been a Gentile, who was Rahab the Hollowed of Jericho, the one who saved the Hebrew spies, Joshua 1 and 2. Instead, he praised Ruth for her righteous behavior and loyalty to her mother-in-law and having left home and kin to care for her. And then Boaz spoke a blessing over Ruth that she would have full reward from the God of Israel, chapter 2, 11 and 12. Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant though I am not like one of your maidservants. Verse 13. And here again, Ruth's humble character is demonstrated. So she returned home to Naomi with plenty of Bali, 
who was delighted to learn all that had happened to Ruth that day. And when Ruth told her that she had met Boaz and how he had extended much kindness to her, Naomi informed her that he was her redeeming kinsman, her Goel in the Hebrew, that is through marriage to Elimelech. And the Goel uh, is legally defined as a family relative, a next of kin whose duty it is to restore or recover the land holdings of a poor relative who had sold it off to survive, even redeeming the relative out of enslavement. And by Mosaic law, property had to be returned to its original owner since the land always belonged to God, who granted it to his people, only to be passed on to the next of kin as an inheritance. And in the case of an impoverished childless widow, it was the expectation that her property would be bought back for her by a kinsman redeemer, whether by a brother of her late husband or another close relative. And in the case when there were none, a member of one's tribe or any interested Israelite could fulfill the duty of the goel. And the other duty of a goel is in leverant marriage, caring for the impoverished widow and perpetuating the deceased bloodline. And let me add here that there is a third goel who avenges the murder of a relative, referred to as the goel hadam, that is the redeemer of blood, the avenging kinsman redeemer. That said, Leveret marriage is a foreshadowing of the redemption of sinners through Christ, who brought the loss back from the enslavement and curse of sin with his blood. Christ redeems the loss and makes them his bride, that they will be saved, cared for, and their inheritance of eternal life in heaven secured, and who in the end will destroy Satan, his demons, and the works of darkness. And getting back to our story, without a second thought, Naomi conceived a plan that would restore their lives through leveret marriage between her kinsman Boaz and her widowed and childless daughter-in-law Ruth. That day, Naomi said to Ruth concerning Boaz, in fact, he is winnowing Bali tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. Ruth 3, 2 through 4. So Ruth agreed to do all that Naomi had told her. And during the night, Boaz suddenly awoke to find Ruth at his uncovered feet. Now, there are scholars who take it that uncovering of his feet was sexual solicitation. However, Ruth was a righteous woman under the instruction of Naomi, whose intentions were righteous, desiring that her daughter-in-law would have security. Chapter 3, verse 1. Ruth's actions were lawful and in line with the practice of leveret marriage. Uncovering Boaz's feet was a customary gesture of availing oneself to their kinsman redeemer for marriage. And I take this as a foreshadowing of lost souls surrendering to the saving grace of Christ, our kinsman redeemer, laying at his feet, so to speak, in surrender and submission. And Ruth said to Boaz, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. In other words, you are my kinsman redeemer. Do what is right. Cover me with your cloak as a token of acceptance. Chapter 3, verse 9. And the term Ruth used for cloak is kanaf, Hebrew for wing, which recalls imagery of God's protective wings from the book of Psalms. And I quote, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. 17.8. And how precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. 36, 7. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. 61, 4. And last, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. 91, 4. 
And Jesus lamented over Jerusalem, crying, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Matthew 23, 37 and 39. And Boaz responded to Ruth, saying, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, and that you did not go after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Chapter 3, 10 and 11. Here, Boaz is a clear type of Christ, the kinsman redeemer of our souls, who in contrast to false gods, represented by the young men Ruth would not go after, has our best interest in mind. That is to raise us out of spiritual impoverishment and bondage of sin into eternal life. And Ruth represents the blood-bought Gentile church of Christ, who have forsaken false religion. Yet there is an obstacle in this drama, and I quote Boaz saying, now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Chapter 3, 12 and 13. And it says, beginning in verse 14, that early in the morning, she arose before one could recognize another. Then he said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Here Boaz is protecting Ruth's reputation as a righteous woman, and perhaps his own. Also, he said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephes of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city, chapter 3, 14 and 15. Now, let me say here that the New King James Version tells us that Boaz gave her six ephes of volley, which would have amounted to six bushels, an impossible load for Ruth to carry. Certainly, Boaz would have given her a doable amount, perhaps equivalent to six pounds worth. And it has been taken that the number six points to the end of labor, just before the Sabbath rest, which Ruth was about to experience in her life, coming into her rest from hardship and labor. And so Ruth returned to Naomi with the Bali, who was waiting to hear all that had transpired from her daughter-in-law. And after Ruth reported all to her, Naomi said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Chapter 3, verse 18. And in chapter 4, we read that Boaz was off to meet Ruth's unnamed next of kin at the city gate, which was the city hall of the ancient Near East, where contracts were made, approved, and witnessed by the elders and magistrates. And Boaz told Naomi's kinsman about her need for her property to be redeemed. And I quote, And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. Chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And so Naomi's kinsmen agreed to redeem her land. But then Boaz said, And then there is the matter of Maclon's widow, Ruth the Moabitess, who must also be, re be redeemed for the sake of her husband's name. But the kinsman was not willing to do that, stating that it would ruin his own inheritance and not having the means to redeem both Naomi's estate and Ruth's. And this Kinsman is recognized as a type of the law, which does not have the power to redeem sinners. And so was the custom that to confirm an agreement, one would take a sandal off and give it to the other as a token of the agreement. Chapter 4, verse 7. 
And I quote, therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. Then turning to the elders, Boaz declared, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Maclon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Maclon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. Verses 9 through 11. Then the elders spoke a prophetic blessing over Boaz and Ruth, saying, The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. Verses 11 and 12. And this prophetic blessing was fulfilled, for Judah begot Perez, and from Perez lineage came King David, from whose line came Jesus of Nazareth, the most famous of all Bethlehemites. And so Boaz and Ruth were married, and Ruth bore a son whom the women of Bethlehem named Abed. And they blessed Naomi, declaring, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel, and may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also, the neighbor women gave him a name saying, there is a son born to Naomi and they called his name Abed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David, verses 14 through 17. Now, the women would not have known about Jesse and David as would Samuel years later centuries later, who wanted to make a point of David's ancestry. Now the infant Abed gave Naomi great comfort in filling the emptiness from her loss. Abed was the child of a redemption and restoration of her joy. And Abed can be taken as a sign that Jehovah will not abandon his people, but would send a kinsman redeemer, his only son to save them from the penalty of their sin. Further, Abed, whose name means servant, is a type of Christ, even the prophet Isaiah's suffering servant. Chapters 49 through 53 of Isaiah. Jesus of Nazareth spoke about himself having not come to be served, but to serve by giving his life for a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 28. But Boaz is a more perfect type of Christ, our Redeemer, our brother, our closest kin, our heavenly Goel. Boaz had the power to redeem Ruth as Christ has the power to redeem the lost. Boaz acquired Ruth as his wife while redeeming her property as well as her life from probable enslavement as Christ redeems us through his blood that we should be saved from the slavery of sin and the penalty of it. Boaz, the master of the harvest in Bethlehem, and Jehovah are depicted as the Lord of the harvest in Matthew's gospel. And I quote, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Matthew 9, 37 and 38. And the marriage between Boaz and Ruth is a shadow of Christ's union with his bride his blood bought redeemed, consummated at the wedding supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19, 6 through 9. As Boaz paid the bride price to have Ruth, Christ paid the bride price for us with his blood. Paul wrote concerning redemption through Christ, in him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, 
which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be the praise of his glory. Ephesians 1, 7 through 12. Thank you, friends, for listening, and I hope that you have reaped from this study a deeper understanding of the depth of the love of Almighty God demonstrated in redeeming humanity from the bondage of sin and its penalty through our kinsman redeemer, Jesus. And I hope that it has inspired you to study the scriptures in order to learn to live for a holy God, to mature in the faith, and to be recreated in the image of Jesus Christ. For as Paul taught the believers at Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 And regardless of how heinous your sins might be, Jesus said, He who comes to me I will in no wise cast out. John 6.37 so if you have not laid your life down at the feet of Christ, surrendering yourself over to him, finding forgiveness for your sin, and receiving the inheritance of eternal life, I urge you to do that now. Everything that is happening lately points to Christ's imminent return. Be ready and watchful. Don't procrastinate. Don't be left behind.